Welcome to Faith on Film with Isaac Hernandez and Holly McClure. Keeping you informed on faith and family entertainment. Hey everybody, welcome to Faith on Film. We got a great show for you today. Holly, what do we have on the show today? We do have a great show. We have a fascinating show. You are going to be fascinated. fascinated with every word in this in this in the show. We are interviewing Dr. Mary Neal. Now, she's in the movie called After Death, which she talks about her. Hmm. Actually, she died and went to heaven experience. But she's also written a book, To Heaven and Back. And so if you, in case you missed the movie or in case you don't see it, To Heaven and Back is her book. And I'm going to interview her. And let's take a look at the trailer for After Death. All right, here we go. No two near-death experiences are the same. Out of nowhere, a trailer truck kept me head on. But they typically occur in a very consistent process. We began to go down the river, and my boat became pinned. I was drowning. The first thing that happens is called an out-of-body experience. And they come to a place of exquisite beauty. They very commonly see a light. Deceased relatives come to meet them. The first person I saw was my grandfather. Now I'm traveling like a rocket ship, straight upwards. And with that... <laughs> Oh my God, I'm alive. I heard a voice before I woke up. You still have a purpose on Earth. I was very skeptical. I never felt alive and then dead. I felt alive and then more alive. I had full brain recordings from the dying human brain. Even though they were unconscious, they were able to give corroborative evidence. She's described herself that she just shouldn't know. The same right. You can't be mystified by that question. What happens after you die? This really does show that there is life after death. With me is Dr. Mary Neal, and her story about what happened to her is in the movie um, After Death. And she has a book out called To Heaven and Back. I want to make sure I got all that right. But she's going to tell her story because there's so much more than even what's in the movie. And Dr. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an absolute privilege, of course. And it was a privilege to be part of this movie because it generates so much hope. It does. And that's a beautiful does. thing. And I will tell you that my story is also one of absolute hope. And my husband and I were kayaking, whitewater kayaking, in Chile in South America. And it's something that's one of our passions. We've done it for decades all around the country and internationally. And when my youngest son was old enough that I thought we could leave the country by ourselves, we went down to Chile and we were kayaking with friends of ours who are professionals. They run trips to Chile every year. And what was going to be our last day of kayaking anyway, we decided to kayak a, a river that's well known for its waterfalls, and I don't mean Niagara Falls, I mean uh, drops of 10, 15 feet, which are certainly exhilarating and challenging. Uh, but as I crested the waterfall, I knew that I was going to have a little bit of a problem. I figured I'd flip, be flipped upside down and probably have to leave the boat and be tumbled around and then spit out downstream, which is never a pleasant experience, but it's part of kayaking. But what happened instead was the most incredible adventure and greatest gift I could ever imagine. I rocketed down and the front end of my boat became pinned or stuck in the rocks and the underwater features. And the boat and I were then completely submerged under eight to 10 feet of water. I'm a spine surgeon. <laughs> I don't know if I relish high stress situations, but I'm very comfortable with them. And so, no, I didn't panic. I didn't do any of those things. But I set about trying to free me from the boat or free the boat, something, anything. I'm also very pragmatic. I knew what my options were. And, of course, they were pretty limited. And I can't explain how this was an active choice. But at a certain point, I made a very, very active choice to ask that God's will be done. And it's a funny thing because... Many people would assume that, well, of course, you ask that God's will be done because you don't have any other options. But I cannot explain. It was a very, very active choice. And I did have a choice, even though it doesn't seem like it. And the very moment, the nanosecond that I asked 
for God's will to be done, regardless of the outcome, I was immediately overcome by a very physical, physical sensation of being held and comforted and reassured that everything would be fine. My husband would be fine. My young kids would be fine, regardless of whether I lived or died. And I knew I was being held by Christ, which, I mean, I, you know, I didn't deserve it. I didn't expect it. Uh, and that's the beauty of it. You know, so none, I, none of us expect it. I have to ask a question. Yes. W were you struggling? Like, because people, because I know me, if I went underwater and I'm running out of breath, I'm, I'm going to be struggling. I'm going to be gasping. I'm going to feel like, did you do that? Or were you just? Like, no. Here's, well. here's the funny thing. Throughout my life, I mean, I had never thought about death. At that point in my life, I had not actually known anyone personally who had died. I had known patients who had died you know, during my medical training, but I had not experienced the loss of a parent, a grandparent, a friend, anything like that. So I really had never thought about death concretely in terms of what actually would happen or what would it be like, except that I was always the person who said, well, I don't care how I die as long as I don't drown. <laughs> yeah. Because I thought drowning would be just exactly what you described. Horrible. Uh, but as it turns out, it was wonderful. I I really didn't have any sense of panic or fear. Um, I, I felt wonderful. I never had the experience of being conscious and then unconscious or alive and then dead. I had the experience of being conscious and then more conscious, alive and then more alive. And so, no, I, I didn't. And it wasn't that thing that people talk about that, oh, a peace came over me. It, it, it wasn't that. It was uh, beyond that. I was propelled into a different reality, a different uh, time and dimension. Uh, I, I was propelled into a spiritual reality. And so, no, <laughs> I, I didn't have that sense of pain. Were, were you physically taken out of your body to heaven then? What happened then? Eventually. I mean, Christ was holding me. And yes, I knew it was Jesus, just like I would know my husband of, you know, 40 years. And I felt the most all-encompassing love and acceptance and grace and while I was held, I was taken through a life review that had nothing to do with judgment and everything to do with love and everything to do with showing me that the promises God has made to each of us are true. And I was also sort of shown again and again and again how those promises are true and how they impact our lives. And then eventually, yes, my spirit left my body and I rose up and out of the river and I was greeted by a group of, I don't know, some things. <laughs> People, spirits, beings, I'm never quite sure what to call them because those words mean different things to different people. But they were so overjoyed, really, really overjoyed to greet me and love me and welcome me. And, and I knew they were there for me. I knew they had known me and loved me as long as I've existed. And I had this overwhelming sensation of being home, of being where I really belong, where we all really belong. And, and it's the home for all of us. And that, that does not diminish the incredible opportunity and adventure of being here on earth. But that's, you know, where, where we go. That's our home. That's, you know, when we're done with this life, we get Mary, to go home and sleep in our own beds. I have to ask, was it a relative? Did you recognize a mother, a grandmother? Because everyone says, oh, you're greeted by people you know. Right. And I will tell you that I knew that these were people who had been important in my life story. Oh. But as I said, at that point in my life, I had not personally known anyone who died. Oh, okay. And so I would not have recognized a grandparent or a great grandparent because I hadn't lost those people, but I knew that these were people who were important in my life. So, for example, maybe it was a grandparent who died before I was born or something okay. like that. I knew that they were people who were important in my life story. I know that now when I go back, 
sadly, there are many people who will be there to welcome me. And yes, I believe I will recognize them. And yes, I believe those people who are important in our lives are there to welcome us and greet us and guide us and protect us and do all of those things. How did it look? I'm just curious, like, how did it look? Because I know there's so much more than we have time to tell, but I want to of course the questions people are going to want to know. Was there golden paved streets? Was it, I know everyone, well, there's bright lights. Here's, here's the thing. I absolutely believe two things. I believe people are overwhelmed by the purity and extents, and ex, uh, the purity and completeness of God's love no matter who you are. The other thing is I'm absolutely convinced that God speaks to us the way we'll understand. And so I experienced exceptional beauty, which for me means colors and flowers and the aromas of flowers. But I think other people will experience music or will experience their dogs running up to them or whatever it is that will speak love into their soul and make them feel known oh. because God knows us fully. And so colors, you know, they don't speak to everyone, but they are something that move my soul. And I believe, I know that we are each fully known and purely loved by the God of the universe. So Did why wouldn't you present us that experience? Absolutely. Did you okay, was Jesus, did you just know it was Jesus? And did you hear him see him, or did you just feel that he was there, like as a spirit, or was there actually? I felt him. I knew him. There was no doubt in my mind then or now. And everyone always wants to know what he looked like. And of course, I grew up in the Midwest, and he didn't look like the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus of my <laughs> my childhood. The one that was on the wall when all of us grew up, the brown exactly, one. Exactly, <laughs> because when I, when I grew up, it was full of Scandinavians, you know. Oh. Uh, but my description of Jesus is that he looked like bottomless kindness and compassion, oh. even though I realize those are not visual attributes. That's what he looked like. When it comes to hair color, eye color, skin color, body habitus, what I will tell you is that there's time is different truly a thousand years are within a second and a second expands into a thousand years and so you can experience a multitude of things simultaneously without having them blend together and i believe we are created beings and we are created in god's image and if we put a hundred of us or a thousand of us in the same room no two people have the same hair color, the same eye color, the same skin tone, the same body habitus. And so there's no reason why Jesus would look like any one of us. Mm. When I looked at him, what I saw was all of us. Mm. And I know that is hard to understand because we don't experience time in that way. But I was able to experience color, for example, simultaneously, but they didn't all mix and make brown or black. Right. I could experience every color of the universe and some I've never seen on earth simultaneously. Right. And, and it was incredible. And so Jesus looked like all of us, Yeah, which makes sense. I mean, yeah. why, why yeah, wouldn't exactly. he? Exactly. How long do you feel like you were there? Like, and you said that's, that it's hard I, to get a time frame, but did you kind of get a time frame? how long it was? Well, I felt like I was there for many, many hours. The friends of mine who were at the river, who ultimately resuscitated me, uh, were, you know, timing everything. And they would say, and I can only go with what they have to say, that I was without oxygen for about 30 minutes. Wow. And then they started CPR. And so this experience that for me seemed to last many, many hours was probably somewhere in that time frame, about a half an hour. Did you get a chance to, I mean, were you asking questions or dialoguing some? I know some people in the story in the movie after death said he asked questions and Jesus answered him. And then another person said he was like, you know, so, I mean, everyone had different experiences. I'm just curious right. about that. We did communicate and not like you and I are, uh -huh. uh, but it was a very pure communication. And yes, for example, when I was 
told that it wasn't my time and I had more work to do on earth and I had to go back to my body, that was after an experience of having this complete understanding of the divine order of the universe. And when I objected, you know, when I said, no, no, no I, I, you know, I, I can stay, uh-huh. uh, I was told about quite a bit of the work that I still had to do and sort of given this laundry list of work. Wow. And some of that, of course, included uh, the coming death of my oldest son, who at the time was only nine. Wow. And I will tell you that everything that I was being asked to do was something that was going to challenge me very deeply and push me out of my comfort zone in one way or another, which, again, makes sense, right? I mean, none of us change or grow or learn when things are stable right. or good because we, we don't want them to. I mean, we grow and deepen our faith and learn when we're challenged. And those challenges are always things that make us uncomfortable. Did so you, there was education. did you, were you pulled, did the Lord lift you up out of the water and you float at the top and your friends found you or did they come down and get you? No, it was the most yeah, remarkable right? experience. I, as my body was coming over the front deck of the boat, I could feel my spirit sort of peeling away. And then I rose up and out of the river and it, and it was me, the real me, the essence of me, the, you know, the, the best me. <laughs> and I rose up and out of the river and I could feel the water sort of uh, falling away from me. And then I was greeted by this group of, of again, people or uh-huh. spirits. So I went up to them. Uh, But while I was with them, I will tell you that I could also have this incredible experience with them and going toward this great dome structure of sorts and having all this knowledge and communication. And at the same time, I could look back at the river and watch my friends pull my body to shore. Wow. And watch them start CPR. I mean, really, the spiritual world is not over here. We exist in the midst of the spiritual world. And so many people ask, for example, if their loved ones can still see them. The answer is yes. I mean, my son eventually was hit by a car and killed. And I do believe he and my stepfather and my dad, all the people who are important to me, I believe that they do know what's happening in my life. Spiritual crossover is real. People, whether... You know, we acknowledge it or not, whether we recognize it or not, there is spiritual crossover and people do enter our lives and help us bring messages, communicate love. And so, you know, it's it's a a different kind of a thing. Wow. You know what? That's going to be really encouraging for um, my nieces because my sister passed away four years ago, breast cancer when she was in her late fifties. And she still had at the time a 16 and a 19 year old daughter. And then the other two were older and off and gone. But the, now the youngest daughter is going to be married next summer at 21. And she said so many times, I wish mom could see me. I wish mom could see what I was going her through. Her mom is going to see her. And oh, is going to be present. Can't wait to tell and, her that. <laughs> yeah, no, without doubt, she'll be there and she'll be her daughter's greatest cheerleader. Oh my gosh, that is without, without doubt. The other thing that is really remarkable is that a lot of people don't have a sense of home as a place where they're loved and welcomed because, you know, obviously not everyone here on earth has a great home. Uh-huh. But the beautiful thing is in God's world, heaven, you know, the spiritual world, whatever you want to call it, it's a very different deal. People are reconciled. People are understanding there's grace, there's uh, forgiveness. I mean, wow. There's complete reconciliation. And wow. so, and they know that. Like home, they know it. Oh, man. It's the real home. It's the home that is everything you could imagine a home should be in terms of that place where you are purely loved and encouraged and valued. Wow. Wow. I have have a question. You said you knew the Lord told you your son was going to die. When you came back, did you tell him that? 
I mean, very rarely do people know when their children or themselves or their spouse is going to pass. I mean, right. That is a very, very heavy burden mm. outside of an absolute trust mm. in God's promises. And so I did not come back and tell him or tell my husband for that matter. I told one friend of mine and I really didn't think I didn't think it was fair <laughs> to mm -hmm. tell them outside mm -hmm. of this absolute trust. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, a few months before my oldest son's 18th birthday, I did tell my husband, uh, and I won't say he was grateful for it, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I did tell him. And then on my son's 18th birthday, which there were reasons why I thought that was sort of, uh, I don't know, his deadline. <laughs> Uh, on his 18th birthday, when I found him alive, I actually did tell him the entire story. Uh, and so ultimately I did. That was 10 years later, but ultimately I did tell him. And he took it took it in stride. <laughs> and uh, and then he was hit and killed, you know, a year, year and a half later. Wow, a year and a half later. Yeah. But you, and that, how gratifying for you to know that he was immediately with the Lord and that it was okay yes. with him, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. I have an absolute trust that wow. there is heaven. There is life after death. I have an absolute pure trust in God's promises that, you know, there is a plan for each one of us that is one of hope. And we are purely known and completely loved and that beauty will come of all things. And obviously, you know, I, I did not want to let my son go. Mm. But if mm. I have complete trust in those promises, then I can have confidence that that was part of the plan for his life, for our family, for the world, that beauty will come of it. And indeed, I mean, there has already been quite a bit that's come from both his life and his death. But I also know that our life is, you know, a blink of time. Blink and of time. when my work here on earth is done, he'll, I'm sure, be one of the people who'll be greeting me. I have a question. I have many questions, actually, but <laughs> I know. thousands of questions. <laughs> thousands of questions and not enough time to do them all. You're a doctor. So I am. coming back, um, have you like have you operated on anyone or dealt with anyone where the Lord told you kind of what was going to happen? I mean, did did what he tell you in heaven affect how you were a doctor here on earth? Yes. How can it not? Can it not? <laughs> I yeah. mean, when you have an absolute knowledge and trust in all of God's promises, it can't help but change your experience of every moment of every day. Because the fact is, everything we do, everything we think, and everything we say actually matters. We don't have much time here. We each have work to be doing. We need to be out God's work. And it did change the way I practiced medicine. I certainly prayed for my patients. I prayed for myself. I prayed for the surgical staff. Uh, it also gave me a very different outlook on their problems. I mean, I oftentimes, as a spine surgeon, took care of people who had devastating injuries. Mm -hmm. But because I knew that that injury was part of a plan for their life and that beauty could come of it, I had this great opportunity to help them see it as an opportunity. And because of that, I had many patients whose lives were radically changed. But what it did is it forced them out of their comfort zone and it forced them to explore other gifts that they'd been given. Wow. And there are people who did all sorts of things. I mean, I had a guy who was a, a bricklayer, I mean, a manual laborer who turned into this incredible artist, things that he never would have even dreamed of trying if he hadn't been injured. Mm. And so it definitely brought hope into situations where oftentimes there was very little hope. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Gosh, I don't know how much more time you have. I could go another 
half an hour with you. <laughs> this is just fascinating to talk about. Um, but you know, Pete, you do have a book. And in your book, it probably gives all these details. In fact, you said you have two. Tell us where people can find your book and, and find out all about your story. And then we'll tell where people can see the movie. Yeah. So I wrote uh, the first book, To Heaven and Back, as something that I had been expected to do. And I wrote it so that I could sort of check it off my list of things I had to do. But I didn't actually expect anyone to read it. And then I wrote the second book, Seven Lessons from Heaven, really as a way to expand on some of what I learned during my time in heaven and what I learned in terms of this transition from a hope or faith in God's promises to an absolute trust. Because I know that anyone, you don't have to have a profound spiritual experience to do this. I know that everyone has the ability to make this transformation to an absolute trust. And I think it's important because trust is what allows you to truly live the joy-filled life that I believe we are meant to live. And so I wrote the second book really as a way to inspire people, motivate people, sort of lay a, a groundwork of how to make that transition and why why I bother. <laughs> you know, so what? I mean, why why is it important and how can it change your daily life today? Because I think that's what it's all about. I mean, I, I think we are meant to live without all of the destructive emotions of, you know, fear, anxiety, regret, remorse, bitterness. I think all of those destructive emotions represent times in our life or places in our life where God's love is absent because mm. we don't allow it. Mm. And so I don't think we need to live like that. I think we can live in a joy-filled space. Holly, that was amazing, like you said at the beginning of the show. I mean, wasn't it amazing? All those things, <laughs> it blows your mind. It, it completely yeah. opens you up to feeling, oh my gosh, the, the loved ones who have died, you know, mm -hmm. that they can do good things in your life. That it, yes. there's a peace when you go that he's right there with you before you even, you don't have to go through trauma. I, right. it, that to me is so reassuring for things for people in a car wreck, what's going on in the Middle East, things like that. It's like, the Lord yeah. loves the people, and he takes it and cares for you, even Absolutely. into heaven. I, of course, was thinking of my brother when I saw the movie and thinking, wow, yeah. he experienced all that. So it did yeah. make me feel good. It gave me some peace. Yes. My mother, my dad, my sister. Yeah. I mean, those that we love before, it does give exactly. us peace. Right. Where can people go see it, Isaac? Well, they can just go to angel.com forward slash after death, and that's where they can either buy tickets or pay it forward. Holly, I love that. I love that they can pay it forward and let somebody else see it as well. That's beautiful. What a great way to do a film. Absolutely. Everyone, I hope you go see this. I hope you'll, you know, get her book. It will give you hope, and I hope you've enjoyed the show. That's right. See you next week. Write to us at faithonfilmtv at gmail.com. That's faithonfilmtv at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at faithonfilmtv. Also, go to our YouTube channel, Faith on Film TV, and hit the subscribe button and the bell for notifications on our latest Faith on Film shows.